everyone present here today. I am Nicole Mathias, your host, and we will be presenting our fourth webinar on the topic language acquisition with AI agents in immersive environments by one of our alumnus of Batch 2015, Dr. Rahul Devekar. Also, if you have any questions during this session, feel free to type them on your YouTube chat box or on your WhatsApp groups. They will be taken up in your Q&A session. Next, I would like to invite our very own professor, Dr. Amaya Tripathi to address the crowd. Good morning, everybody. I welcome you all to this webinar. I am Dr. Amir Kumar Tripathi, Professor in Department of Computer Engineering, Don Bosco Snap Technology. DBIT, known as Don Bosco Snap Technology, is, is coming with uh, research and development and innovation in a big way. This is the dream of DBIT's stakeholders in this era now. Research and development plays a crucial role in innovation process. It's essential and investment in technology and future capabilities, which is transformed into a new products, process and services. Research means to carefully analyze the problem or to do the detailed study of the specific problems by making use of special scientific methods. The main purpose of the research is to get deep into the topic so that something helpful can churn out, which can be helpful for everybody and use in that particular niche sector. The quality which you maintain, which while research should always be a high so that the information that you can be used in a certain policies and any future projects, which is implied to that. Working on any... Hello. Yes, ma'am. I think so. I yeah. think so. So is net Yes. Hello. Yes, sir. You are yeah. connected now. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. Yes. Research is to see what everybody else has seen and to think about nobody else thought. It. In simple words, have you ever thought about how would be the world have been without any development of technology or anything? Well, in life, people enjoy now all the things that we do in minutes, which earlier looked impossible, are all because of the research. Research not limited to any one sector, but has been done for almost every sector. So research plays a very important role in our daily life. Research is the best and reliable way to understand and act on the complexity of various issues that we as human are facing. So aside from the pure pursuit of knowledge for its own sake, research is linked to the problem solving. So what is this mean is the solving of people's problem. That is what other people's experience as a problem. We in DBIT, in computer department, we encourage our students to involve in research and innovation towards a product development. That's we have been trying since many years. Now in this webinar, we have our own alumni Dr. Rahul Devekar, who has been involved in the research since he has been joined DVIT. Now, Rahul Devekar recently graduated with a PhD in computer science from the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. He is advised by Dr. Hui Su and Prof. James Handler. Rahul's dissertation showed a new way to learn a foreign language with the AI and markless immersion. He has authored several peer reviewed papers 
related to his work and his work was been covered by popular media outlets such as MIT Technology Review Magazine, Indian Express as well, New York Times, etc. His work won the outstanding poster award at the AI Horizon Colloquium by the IBM Research AI and an award of four minute, three minute uh, thesis competition at the Rensselaer. During his time in the Rensselaer, he has served as a teaching and research assistant, guest editor of ACM XRS magazine, associate chair for the ACM CHI conference, and continues to contribute to his research community. He has collaborated and worked with experts from IBM Research, Amazon, Salesforce, etc., and with universities around this world. He is eager to join educational teaching service as an associate research scientist from the August this year onwards. Most importantly, he is definitely the alumnus of Don Bosco, and we are proud of him. And we are also proud that he is also an ACM student chapter at a DVIT when he was working with DVIT. He has graduated in 2015 before he went to Rensselaer to pursue his master's and PhD. I would like to welcome Dr. Rahul Deveker to the webinar, and I would like to invite him to, to say whatever he has experienced and what whatever you want to say. Rahul, now this is your time. Well, thank you, Amiya, sir. And thank you, Nicole, uh, for the excellent introduction. I, I don't know if you can see my video and my audio correctly. Um, it's working perfectly. OK, good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, one thing is right. I am a very proud DBIT and ACM uh, alumnus. I, I don't know if you can see the logo here. Still wearing the ACM t-shirt. <laughs> um, I put it on just for this. Uh, but let me share my screen um, and then we can start with the talk. Is my screen seen okay? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all right. So you can see my slide. Right. Yeah. So my uh, topic is foreign language acquisition with AI agents in immersive environments. Um, and um, there's really two outcomes to this talk. Uh, one is the career path from the engineer um, to a scientist. And um, like Amiya sir already said, I, um, I graduated from DBIT in 2015. I did my MS in information technology at RPI in 2016, and then um, just recently uh, defended my um, doctoral thesis. And um, you know, I'm just uh, finishing up all of my projects here, and then I will be joining uh, ETS as a research scientist. So that's one aspect of the talk. Um, you know, whenever you're asking questions towards the end or in the middle. Um, feel free to ask me about um, this career path that I have explored. I hope. Um, I can answer those questions to you. So in case you want to choose to do a PhD, um, you can try to, um, you know, some guideline over here. Um, the second aspect is of course my uh, dissertation and my research itself. Uh, and I'm just going to jump right into that. Um, so my broad research challenge is to augment the learning of Chinese as a foreign language um, and Chinese as a foreign culture. Uh, why Chinese? Um, I, I'm uh, just uh, to clarify. I'm here in the U.S. now. I'm at a U.S. university, so everything is from um, this perspective. So in the United States, it's one of the fastest growing languages, and it's also the hardest language to learn. It's level five. Um, that's the highest level. Why is it so hard? Uh, well, one that it's a tonal language. Um, tonal means that when you say something. Uh, when you say a syllable, like you say uh, on your right, you see the screen over here, and uh, this this character right here is pronounced as ma, and um, that means mother. Uh, but if you change the tone even a little bit, it starts to mean something very different. So instead of ma, if I say ma, that means a horse. Could you tell that difference? <laughs> that's really hard, right? For people who don't speak a tonal language, um, that's a really hard thing to tell. Uh, the other reason what makes it so hard is there are estimated, and no one knows this for sure, but estimated 47,000 characters in the Chinese language. And uh, these are some examples of the Chinese characters you see right here. 
Um, and an average person, you know, if you wanted to read a newspaper, you would have to know 3,500 characters. Um, and that's what makes it so hard. Um, so, you know, because this language is so hard, you want some technology, you want some external, external resources to augment um, the learning of this foreign language. And so my goal is to build interpersonal conversational skills in Chinese um, using AI and immersion. Um, so let's look at foreign language acquisition in a traditional sense or for that matter, um, any learning in a traditional sense. You go to your classroom, your computer science, computer engineering classroom, and these are sort of you know, roughly the learning stages. By the way, this is valid even if you're learning online on a YouTube app or, or something like that. Um, you know, the first stage is instruction. Someone comes tell you, to someone, and usually the teacher or a recorded video tells you that, oh, this is what's happening. Um, you know, these are the theories and so on and so forth. They give you some homework. You go home and you do that. Then you submit that assignment. You get some feedback from your teacher. Uh, and then you go back to the teacher for some reflection. Maybe you say, you know, I, I expected to get 10 out of 10. Why did you give me a uh, five out of 10? And then the teacher will be able to tell you why. So that's reflecting on your own work. Uh, and you keep doing this until the end of the semester or the unit test or whatever. Um, and you give an exam and you receive some marks on your exam as well. And then you finally receive a grade. Um, so in the foreign language acquisition domain as well, it's not very different from this. Um, they are the same parts, but except when students are doing homework, yes, they can do their reading homework. Yes, they can do their writing homework, but who are they going to practice their conversations with? Now, I want, to I want you to imagine, you know, you are trying to learn Chinese or French or German, anything you want. Um, you know, you go from your classroom, you go from your Duolingo app, you go home, you want to practice your conversation. Who are you going to talk with? Um, you know, and this is a, this is a very... A uh, big challenge that foreign language learners face. Where and with whom can I go try my newly acquired language? Um, so that's a problem that I want to solve because um, absolutely to understand and to, to speak more fluently practice is the only thing and we want to uh, provide the students with as many practice opportunities as possible. Um, so what are some available methods in foreign language education? You know, FL means foreign language, by the way. Um, so there are apps and flashcards. Um, so whoever has learned any foreign language, you have seen this. Um, if you have even tried to expand your vocabulary in English or Hindi or any of your uh, native languages, again, flashcards are something that are commonly used. Um, there's internet videos. Um, these days you can go on YouTube, pretty much learn anything. Um, but that happens to be an input only learning model. What does that mean? Uh, we are all computer science. We understand uh, input and output. Uh, in an internet video, you're only taking in information. You're not producing anything. You're not uh, speaking to the video, right? Um, it's, all, it's all input. Um, well, the third method is you can actually enroll in a class. And in that case, you have your peers and your classmates to role play with. Uh, but mind you, there's a big shortcoming over here that there is no visual context. Like imagine these two people on the right. Um, they are trying to practice how to order food in the Chinese. Uh, in the Chinese uh, language, in a Chinese restaurant. But they are clearly in a white wall classroom. So they have to imagine, oh, maybe I'm in a Chinese restaurant and this fake scenario that I'm trying to, or trying to order some dish that uh, I've never heard about or something like that. So, you know, somewhere in your mind when you're practicing it, you know it's not authentic. And that does not help you with your learning. And even if you do that, by the way, your exposure is limited to the classroom. Your classmates are the only people who probably who you can practice this with, because like I said, once you leave the classroom, um, no one else knows the language that you're speaking in, right? Because by definition, a foreign language is the one that's not popularly spoken where you live right now. Uh, well, one other way of learning a foreign language is uh, a study abroad immersion program. So what would happen is if I'm trying to learn Chinese, I will leave my country, um, spend a, a semester in China. And, um, you know, that has all of the great things. It, it gives you the authentic context. We are not pretending to order food anymore. We would actually be ordering food. Uh, it is situated in experiential learning, which means you're learning by doing and not just reading from a a textbook or uh, listening to um, an, an internet video. Um, you learn out of necessity. Now that's a big thing. 
imagine you went to china you didn't know chinese uh, you cannot move around right you cannot take the bus you cannot order food you would you would be stuck over there so you would learn out of necessity um, and uh, research has shown that participation increases the understanding of culture increases and most importantly uh, you, know, you get to practice real world skills and not just from your textbook so uh, what you know great things so many great things one bad thing how many people can leave their country today and say i'm going to spend a semester to just go study a language very few of us right it, it makes it inaccessible this method of learning um so i want to solve that problem let's see uh, what i can do um so you know this is the gap that i see in the in the education domain and i want to use computer science to help it so let's see how these two can uh, these two fields can come together so in the pedagogy field i just uh, showed you how the language immersion program that is going to a different country and trying to learn a language gives you all of those exposures to authentic conversational opportunities and leads to foreign language acquisition fla is uh, just my way of saying foreign language acquisition um the social scientists would break this down into physical or visual immersion which means that you actually feel as if you're be as if you're in some other place and social immersion which means that you're having social conversations um in that some other place uh by the way how is this possible um you know how can i be somewhere and feel as if i'm somewhere else well there is this concept in social sciences of willing suspension of disbelief uh and i will give you an example have you ever watched an action movie uh, you know one person kicks one other person and then 10 people fall or a person shoots web from their um you know hands and and you believe it and then batman will jump from uh, you know fly using his cape that's um, you know from the angle of physics it sounds pretty much impossible so it's it's you immediately when you see it there is a disbelief that you know this is not possible but for the sake of entertainment you're willing to suspend your disbelief um and that's what i'm hoping my students will do too for the sake of engagement for the sake of learning um for a moment they will give up that disbelief that oh this is all false this is not true and then uh, actually learn the foreign language that's the best we can get right now if we cannot go to the actual country itself and we know it works because it works in movies it works in um you know uh, telephone calls it works in uh, novels and so on um this concept of willing suspension of disbelief so in the computer science language uh, what enables physical or visual immersion is extended reality or x reality and, and and that is really an encompassing term for you know virtual reality headsets uh, mixed reality augmented reality all of those realities they sort of make you feel as if you're somewhere else right um, you know the visuals react to how you move and so on and uh, conversational ai can give you the social immersion aspect of it by talking to an ai agent you actually feel like you're talking to a real person i understand that <laughs> you know sometimes conversational ai is not that great and it's immediate uh, immediately understandable that you know this is a bot not a human um, but there is um, you know we'll get into that later so i'm hoping that if i put extended reality together with conversational ai you would get a feeling of being somewhere else having a conversation with some other person and that would give you the same exposure to authentic conversation opportunities hopefully and that would lead to foreign language acquisition so that's my hypothesis here is where i start my scientific process i don't know if this is true this is my guess um and uh, the rest of the 45 50 minutes i'm going to try to convince you that you know this is actually true um so again broad research goal on the left side uh, you know the broad research goal is to bring ai and immersion uh, in such a way to to bring you china instead of you going to china you know bring you that country so on the left you see the immersive environment this is a 360 degree panoramic screen it goes all the way around this human that you see uh, it's human scale this panda face is probably as big as um, this person's half body um and this space can make you feel as if you're somewhere else and inside that space this ai agent embodied as a panda face um 
and you can have conversations with that AI agent in such a way that you know the AI agent is a waiter and you are um, there to order some food. So you can ask, you know, how many people are you? Where two people? Can I get you water? Yes, and all of that. Um, one 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 question I get asked very uh, quickly is, yeah, why this expensive massive screen uh, when you could just use a VR headset? Right, you get that Google cardboard box for I don't know, uh, you know, thousand rupees or something now. Um, so why this? Or two reasons. One, if you have ever used that VR headset, you know that you feel nauseous and tired very quickly. Um, you know, they are just not at that point where they can be used for a continuously long time. And for learning, that's exactly what you need. You cannot learn something in five minutes. You have to spend a lot of time to do something. I, you, I'm sure you know this, I, you, you are all students. Um, the other thing is, once you wear that headset, you are completely disconnected from your actual reality. So if someone is standing next to you, you won't even realize that there is someone. You're completely in that, um, in that virtual um, reality and you have left your physical actual real reality behind and that's that's not a great thing why not uh, we know that we learn best when we learn together that's why uh, when you do the projects um, you know the your professors try to put you in groups together groups of two and two and three groups of ten sometimes uh, why because collaborative learning is, is has known benefits um, to it. So we want our students to have that benefit. Uh, we, don't, we don't want them to be completely shut off from the real world. So that's why this expensive, um, massive human scale panoramic screen over here. And I will show you how that exactly looks um, in the next few slides. I know this is not a great picture. It's, um, it's hard to capture this uh, massive screen in one photo. So I'll show you a video later on. But um, going further, um, I focus on the AI aspect of it. And uh, you might notice that, you know, uh, yes, AI can do certain things, but real conversations are nuanced. Um, they have many tiny things. So when, when two humans communicate, they use uh, their language, their intonations, gestures, facial expressions, and there's usually more than two people. Um, and, and this is a really hard challenge for machines because machines have to now understand not just speech. Uh, you remember Alexa and Siri, hear only speech and they make so many blunders. Um, so so in, an AI agent that really wants to come off as uh, you know almost human um, needs to understand not just speech, but gestures and uh, all of those others, multiple modalities, uh, as I would say. So a modality, you know, speech could be one modality, gesture could be one modality. Um, two, it needs to understand multi-user input. Uh, we almost, uh, when we talk to Siri or Alexa, it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation most of the times. And, and the, the bot is designed as such. It does not consider that there may be one more than one user. So how do we do that? Um, and then generating the relevant output at the relevant time. Um, you realize these are, uh, these are bots that want to behave like humans. They are not just sitting in the room waiting for someone to say, turn on the light. They want to proactively come talk to you um, to make you feel, um, you know, more engaged. So, you know, these things put together, that's actually called conversational artificial intelligence. And um, that's what I'm going to get into next. Um, so just to give you a brief idea, going more into what goes into conversational AI. Um, you know, I spoke about multimodal dynamics understanding speech and gestures, a standard and non-standard, what does that mean? A standard means there are usually data sets published for speech recognition, there are data sets published for gesture recognition, but real life is not a data set. Uh, it differs from what is represented in the data set and the AI agents must be able to, um, uh, you know, still understand it. Um, and then the second part is understanding meaning in context. So using the intonation, hesitations, um, you know, not just what is said, but also how it is being said along with the gesture and the facial expression because it communicates so many things, right? Even a simple pause communicates that I want to really stress on something. Um, uh, and so it's hard for machines to understand that. Um, so that's one aspect of it. The other is understanding multi-user dynamics. First, it has to identify how many people are in the room. 
and then it has to identify well, oh someone is saying something who is that person who's saying something now try to think how do you do this you use your use your eyes you see whose lips are moving you try you remember someone's voice uh, you know so it's a really complex process it's not easily uh, put into machines um, and then what are they saying is the other part. And then you know, who are they saying it to? Am I speaking to the person next to me or am I speaking to the AI agent um, and all of those things. And then um, you know, certain things to consider are also group dynamics and uh, you know, computing whether, I, whether the AI agent should respond or not and so on. Um, and once you realize that, oh, I have to respond as an AI agent, you re realize I have to respond. Well, what should the response be? Um, someone said hi. Should I say hi back? You know, you, this cannot be programmed. This is this is this is AI. So uh, you know, certainly I have not solved all of these challenges, but you know, I'm just giving you the the scope of this massive problem that we have in making AI agents close to human beings. Um, and so this is an architecture. I just pulled one of the latest ones. Uh, you can see there's an environment, there is multiple agents, um, that's A11, A12, A13, um, and they're connected to apps. There are human activity workers that you know, recognize speech and uh, you know, computer vision systems that recognize gestures and so on, and all of those are connected to cloud services um, and all of that. And really, um, you know, if you are not getting this diagram, don't worry about it. It took us years to come up with it. So it's hard for me to explain it in, in two minutes, uh, but that's not the, the, the main uh, goal of it. I just want to show you that um, this, is, uh, this, is, this is quite a deep research topic. So um, with that, I have um, done some of my motivation. And next I'm, you know, assume that the implementation is also done because you know if I show you the code you're going to get bored <laughs> so um, let's assume the implementation is done let's just go into user factors so uh, with this uh, interaction in 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 an in a virtual restaurant with a panda with this sort of a dialogue with two people uh, we ran a pilot study uh, when Amaya sir started he said we use certain methods in the research um, you know, to find out answers. And one of them is a pilot study. What does a pilot study mean? We just start, uh, you know, just, you just build something, put something together, try to test it out with real users. That's one of the methods in research. And we found a bunch of things um, that we are doing wrong. And that's a great thing. So that those are all things that we can solve, right? Um, so, and I try to categorize them into general user factors and uh, factors that are specific to language learners. So general means that, um, you know, these three things and, and don't try reading it. Um, the next few slides are all going to go into details of these things. Um, but the first category is something that you and I will also experience with AI agents. And then the second category, specifically if you're trying to learn a foreign language with an AI agent, you would experience um, some of these things. Um, so first thing under the general user factor is wake up words. How do you talk to the system? Um, usually when you talk to an AI agent, you have to say Alexa, hey Google, hey Siri, or something like that. Now this is fine if you're just um, you know, giving one command saying Alexa, turn off my lights, and then you're going away. But imagine you're trying to have a dialogue that's continuous, and then it's really hard and unnatural to say someone's first name before every sentence, right? Imagine I was giving this talk and before every sentence, I had to say audience, audience, audience. And, and that would be really awkward. We don't talk like that. And, and um, there is no way for AI agents to know unless you say their name, um, that who is talking to who. Um, so some solutions exist in, in the market already in, in research as well. Uh, one is that extended attention. Um, it, once you once the you finish talking or the AI agent finish, finishes talking, they still hear for like ten more seconds if you have to say anything. And if you say something, they will take it as if you're talking to it. This is great if it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Not so great if there is another human in that same room because now you may be trying to talk to that other human, and the AI agent will think as if you're talking to it. So the other way is understand multimodal cues, um, like visual cues, acoustic cues, text-based cues, and so on. Um, you, you know, acoustic um, you know, strength, um, where is someone looking, and so on. So I, you know, hopefully 
this is the landscape. And if you solve this landscape, the AI agent will be able to come up with an answer for, are you talking to me or who are you talking to? Um, and that's the goal over here. So uh, my hypothesis was that people try to look at the person they try to speak to, and therefore head orientation must be a good indicator and a good trigger. So I ran another user study, um, oops, where there is an AI agent over here on the screen, there's a camera. This is a simple um, you know, web camera that's looking at these users. And mind you, this is a pilot study, so I don't have to use the expensive room. Um, and there are two humans uh, in the same room. They are both talking to AI agents and each other. Um, and I thought, well, we'll see if we, I can get away with just head orientation. I know that there is a lot of things that go into um, determining who is talking to who, but let's just see what happens to head orientation. I found out that there's a bunch of things that happen, oh my God. Uh, one, that failure to detect faces, um, for example, user, when, when you're thinking, you 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 know, um, this picture right over here, you stroke your chin or you, um, you know, hide your face somehow. And now AI, you and I can tell that there is still a face over here, but AI agent, if it misses the lips or if it misses the nose, it's, it's not going to uh, understand that there is a face over there. So there will be a failure to detect a face. Uh, sometimes the head just moves too fast for the machine to compute anything. And that's not a big problem, but, um, you know, the other problems are quite um, bigger than that. So effect of situational attractors, what are situational attractors? Um, this author right here, uh, Kattenmeiser and his, um, and his colleagues came up with this term called situational attractor. Um, right now, when I'm talking to you, your laptop is a situational attractor. That notification on your phone is a situational attractor. Uh, and so in my case, in my uh, pilot experiment, the situational attractor was the other person that's sitting um, in the room and the paper that's in front of the um, of the subject, right? So the subject would try to talk to the AI agent, but they would suddenly look at their page or look at me for something. Um, sometimes people look away to re recollect a word. Sometimes they look away um, um, towards their partner for a help and all of these things. Don't let the AI agent know that, oh, are you talking to me? Why are you looking at him if you're talking to me? Um, you know, they are not as flexible as we are. We understand humans, um, they don't. So a positive observation that came out of that was users are willing to accommodate AI's deficiencies. Uh, how did we find that out? We saw, and this has been documented by uh, other researchers as well, that when you are talking to AI agents, you try to speak up a little more. You speak a little more loudly, you speak a little more clearly, because we know that AI agents do not recognize our speech. So we want to do better. Um, we are willing to accommodate the deficiency. And this goes back to that suspension of disbelief, right? For the sake of engagement, you will say, all right, you don't know so well. Let me, uh, let me try to do better for you. Um, and so the challenge is we just need to convey how, you know, what can the user do better to talk to the AI agent? And hopefully it will all just work out if we do this. So modified hypothesis, make the user aware of the system's understanding, and that will lead to the users, you know, trying to say, all right, I see that you are not getting me, let me adjust myself. Um, and then the AI agent could convey a bunch of things. Um, these are, you know, you could choose any design. I chose this design where the green dot says, yes, you are paying attention. Red dot says, you're not paying attention. You know, arrow says, look up to talk to me. Uh, or this arrow says, look left to talk to me. And then I, I show the transcriptions. Transcription means the text of whatever is uh, the user is saying in different colors to um, you know, signify what the AI agent understands. So red means it does not understand anything. Uh, green means it understands and can do something. And gray means that it understands, but it thinks that you were not speaking to it. Um, turns out this was massively usable. We, we uh, got the scores and there's a bunch of charts over here and statistical analysis that, you know, for the sake of time, I won't go into it. But the head post based system or head orientation triggered system was preferred over the wake up word system. It was intuitive uh, for, for users to talk that way. Uh, even with the AI agents deficiencies, mind you. So um, great finding for us. Yes, okay, problem solved. Next, uh, expectancy mismatch between AI's capability 
and uh, what we know about AI's capability. So how many times do you go to Siri or your Alexa and you say, you know, if I told it to switch off the lights, will it be able to do that? Uh, you know, if I asked it, what is um, 10 to the power of infinity, will it know the answer? Well, I don't know, right? And this is, a, this is a problem all across whenever we talk to AI agents. Um, so in our pilot studies, we saw that users just walked in and they, you know, just, or didn't have any words, um, just dots. <laughs> you could see the confusion on their faces. Um, then they would ask something like, oh, are you an American citizen? And the chatbot would say, sorry, I don't understand. And that's the most annoying thing to hear from an AI agent, by the way, in my opinion. Um, so how do we solve this? Well, um, setting up a conversational experience is how. Um, so instead of the AI agent now just saying welcome. And then you know, if it says welcome, the user can be confused. User can ask for a parcel or a takeout, or you know, they can ask to dine in. Instead of that, uh, how about we change the design in such a way that agent says welcome, how many people are you? And now there's only one answer, right? You, know, you can say we are two, we are three, we are five, but it reduces the scope from you know, the infinite number of nodes that can happen to maybe one or two nodes. And that really helps the user focus on how they can reply instead of just being confused the whole time. Oh, great. Um, and and um, what's the third thing, the third question? Social rules of AI agents. Now we saw, um, you know, when you look at the AI agent, the AI agent understands that you're talking to it, but should it still respond? Um, well, I don't know what are the social rules. And this happens especially in, in a two plus party conversational inter, uh, interaction. Like if there are one AI agent or two AI agents and two human beings, this is a really complex problem. Um, sometimes you are talking to someone, but they don't have to respond. Sometimes you're not talking to someone in a group discussion and they still want to you know, get in their word um, in the discussion. And, and we want AI agents to sort of model that. Um, and um, just for the sake of time, I'm going to breeze through this. But one thing that we can do with this is um, also try to teach culture along with language. You know, teaching a culture is extremely important because the one who knows the language and does not know the culture is called a, for, is called a fluent fool in, in literature and in research. So we don't want our students to be that. Um, and, and multiple people, a group discussion gives a better idea of what's going on in the culture. Um, so putting it all together, I'm going to show you finally a video that I promised a um, long time ago of what this looks like. So, you know, so far we were talking about, um, so far we were talking about the restaurant, but this is a street market negotiation domain. Uh, I just told you the culture is important. Well, one important cultural difference between the United States and China, or for that matter, even the United States and India, is about bargaining in, in street markets. You know, you go to buy vegetables. Uh, there's so many times that you say, no, that is too expensive. Uh, give it to me cheaper. That's not something that's common in the United States. So we want to teach them that, that this happens. So you should be prepared for this. Um, and um, AI agents might be able to do that. So we'll see a video. Uh, hopefully the audio comes okay. So this is the AI, uh, this is the immersive environment. Um, this is one AI agent. This is another AI agent who's a shopkeeper. Um, this is a third AI agent uh, and some other just um, animations um, in the background over there. And so um, a user is going to walk in and you notice that he won't say any wake up word. Do you have water? It costs $7. I can lower my price. How about that? How much for the water? You can get it for $4. I'll give it to you cheaper. How much for the water? The price for it is $3. I'll take it from you. You got it. So you see, this is, this is sort of that scenario where two AI agents are actually competing with each other for the sale. And this, is, this commonly happens, right? Um, so um, we want to teach, uh, this commonly happens in some cultures, not in other cultures, especially not in the United States. And we wanted to simulate this situation for them. Um, we found that it was fun, usable, likable in another user study. Um, you know, what made it fun, usable, likable, that there was no wake up word. It was intuitive to issue commands. 
a clear feedback on which agent was listening and which agent was speaking. Mind you, this is very hard. Um, uh, we use actually directional audio. There is, you know, the audio seems to come from where the AI agent is, and that helps us um, know, or that helps the student know which AI agent is speaking. Otherwise, it's really hard, right? Like, which of this you know, avatar is speaking? Um, the response here, the responses were appropriate. The turn taking was appropriate. Um, so, so the AI agents that we modeled behaved appropriately. This was a great finding. Um, so th that solved some of the general user factors, and and let's get into the foreign language learner user factors. Uh, one that, um, oh, one interesting thing about this um, type of a user paradigm is when you talk to AI agent, it's sort of given that you and the AI agent, uh, between you two, you probably know more than the AI agent, um, especially the language, right? We know to craft sentences in so many ways. AI agents typically don't understand, especially complex sentences, they won't understand at all. Um, but in the language learning domain, it's sort of different where even the user does not know the language because they're trying to learn it, right? Um, so they don't know proper nouns. A lot of times their textbooks will teach them something like, you know, if you want to order something at the restaurant, uh, you know how to say, I want, but you don't know how to say the name of this dish. And that happens even if, um, even in, in our life as a general person, um, you go to a restaurant, you don't know how to pronounce something that's on the menu, especially happens to me with, you know, French uh, words in the menu. How do you say that? I don't know. Um, well, the other problem they have, the language learners have, is they cannot absorb AI agents' response every time. Sometimes it's too fast for them. Um, you know, that happens. AI agents speak at a normal pace, but because it's not a language they, the user primarily speaks, um, the response can be too fast. And then even if they understand it, they don't know how to respond. Sometimes they know that, oh, yes, I want to say yes, but I don't know the word for yes. Uh, so sometimes they don't know the language and sometimes they just don't know, you know, how do I respond to this? I don't know nothing. Um, so, you know, this is a joke I make that my vocabulary of Chinese cuisine is, you know, I don't know any of these words. I just call this and that and this and that. <laughs> so um, it, what are the solutions to those problems? Well, dialectic speech. What does dialectic speech mean? Well, it means that when you point at something and you say, uh, I want this, um, you are using two modalities. One is the gesture to point at something you know, like this person is doing and the speech to say, I want uh, something. So the AI agent must be able to understand that when you say, I want that, you know, that is not something that's real. Um, that is an abstract concept. And so it should look at the other modalities and try to resolve that, oh, by that you me meant, you know, the, the hot and sour soup. All right, I get that. Um, you know, I, I will uh, process that now. Um, you could also ask, what is that? And then the AI agent will come up with an explanation for um, what is a hot and sour soup. Uh, and that also helps teach culture because um, food usually has some cultural background. You go to any cuisine, um, they, it, it, it's, it, you know, this king used to make it uh, or this uh, culture used to make it, this uh, religion used to make it, and there is always some cultural background to food. Uh, this is the country it originates from and so on. Um, the other things are verbal contextual helps. Something like you can ask the AI agent, what can I say next? Try doing that with your Alexa. Alexa will have no answer to that. What can I you do next? I don't know, what do you want to do next? Um, something like, can you repeat what you said? Um, and this is different. If you ask Alexa, can you repeat what you said? It will repeat it. But imagine you don't understand the language. So you can, re Alexa can repeat it 500 times. It's not going to help you. So repeat it along with an explanation. Now that's helpful for language learners. Uh, other things like, what did you say? What did you mean? Explain yourself. And as a catch all, if everything fails, just switch to English. Um, come back to uh, the language that you know. So technical challenges that go behind that is, you know, recognizing the gesture, recognizing, you know, fusing all of these uh, data points that are coming from multiple sensors, uh, classifying the intent and so on. Um, and uh, for the sake of time, I won't go too much into it. This is 
another architecture that sort of enables you see, um, you know, we can track your skeletons, we can track what you're saying, we have cameras and so on, and that goes on into uh, other modules. Um, so let me quickly show you a, a video of an actual classroom that we had at RPI. I'm going to forward it. So these two AI agents are trying to speak to this panda and order something from the menu. Um, of course, it's all in Chinese, so um, I don't know how many people understand it. Um, and the rest of the class is watching. So that's a close-up. So she's trying to point at something and say, I want this, and the AI agent will be able to get it. Um, so that's um, that's that's how that's what the interaction looks like in, in a very quick way. So we saw we we got their feedback on this. We saw that realism was not lost. You see, in the real world and the immersive world, they almost rate um, things um, in a similar way. Uh, pointing was the most used. The didactic speech, I want this, what the students really loved and found that to be extremely useful. Um, encouragement, help, and all of those great things. Um, you know, probably. Um, can go through that quickly, but for the sake of time, I'll brush through it. Well, this is all great. Um, you know, these can actually be looked at as design guidelines for conversational AI. Uh, one of the things to note here is conversational AI, a lot of people say today, it is what websites used to be 20 years ago. You know, everyone knew how to design a website, but there were no design guidelines. Now there is a design guideline that you must have a menu, you must have a home button, you must have a contact us button. 20 years ago, no one knew this. And conversational AI is at that same stage today where, you know, yes, you can program an AI agent, but no one has those guidelines. Um, like no one knows, uh, you know, that an AI agent must be able to respond to, hey, uh, Siri, can you repeat that, for example? Um, we don't know that. If we knew that, we can program it, yes, but we don't know that. That's the problem. That's the research problem here. So these are some design guidelines for any programmer who's coming up with a conversational AI. Um, you know, this is generated by research. Now, engineers can take it and scale it up to Siri, Alexa, and so on. Well, so far, we saw many of the um, AI agents and uh, many interactions in street markets and restaurants, they're all great, they, they look really cool, but do they have any educational value? That's the big question, right? Um, you can have all of the cool technology, but if it does not teach anything, then uh, you know what good is it? So yes, another study, um, and I will go back to the uh, haggling video, and I'm just going to show a slice, of course, I cannot show you all, everything, um, so the Hagley video, we tried to test that in a mixed methods user study with 10 participants. Um, and this was a task-based language learning method. What do I mean by that? When you learn language, you can either learn uh, how to use, you know, you can learn how, how to memorize vocabulary. You can memorize the grammar and the sentence structure, and that's all great. But the real uh, value comes from when you're able to put that vocabulary, put that set grammar together to complete a task, to complete a real world task. And that's called the task-based language teaching method. It's a, it's a well-known method in language teaching. Uh, it's similar to how you do um, mathematics. You know, you know how to do two plus two, four, but when you put that in the broader context of solving a big problem, um, that of solving a real world problem, that's when um, there is some real value. And the tasks that we design for the students go in line with the input process output model of learning. So remember, uh, you know, in the very beginning of this, um, the slides, I said that YouTube is an input only way of learning. You only listen, you don't produce. Um, so this, this method right here that I have showed you has input, you listen to what AI agents are saying, you process it, you think about it, and then you also generate some new words from your own mouth and that helps you learn how to listen and speak. Um, and so we collected a bunch of data, uh, you know, just to give you a quick snapshot, the target was 32 vocabulary words since six sentence structures. You don't stop there. You uh, do the, these seven tasks or learn to do these seven tasks, like identifying the price of an object, 
um, or like expressing that you want to buy something and so on. Um, and, and you know, you can read those <laughs> um, uh, tasks um, later, but for the sake of time, I'll just brush through it. Um, this was the schedule, they had a pre-test. Um, so you give them a test, you see how much they already know. They do four learning sessions, they do a post test. Um, so we find that between, you know, we subtract the post test from the pre-test, you find how much they learn. Then you give them a two week break and try to test them again. Uh, what does this do? This shows how much people remember. Um, so yes, you learned, but you know, after three weeks, did you still remember it? You know, we will see. Um, so learning session one and two, they learned some vocabulary, they learned some uh, conversations and so on. Um, and I would have shown you the video, but it's, it's sort of the same. Uh, the total scores, um, you know, this is the pretest. Um, this is how much, this is the mean, this is the average uh, pretest score. You see it significantly increased in the post test and it sort of stayed constant uh, in the delayed post test. So, so students learned something and they remembered whatever they learned uh, over the period of three weeks. And this is across vocabulary, listening, comprehension, and speaking. Um, by the way, I have to point it out that this is the first ever study done um, that proves that AI agents and uh, immersion can help students learn a foreign language across vocabulary, listening, comprehension, and speaking. Uh, most of the software that you can download typically will uh, try to test you on vocabulary and grammar and stop over there. They don't test you on speaking or comprehension or, or listening, um, especially speech-based, right? Um, like for example, Duolingo, you can you can you cannot have a conversation over there. You can just uh, uh, very simple conversations. So um, you know, students reported that they learned a lot of things. So this is also a great thing for us. Um, but most importantly, we saw that students are able to create meaning together. What does that mean? That they were, you know, they were not just remembering something from their textbook and blurting it out. They were able to create meaning. And they were able to talk to each other and find out you know, what is a fair counter bid to, to this um, shopkeeper. They were changing values in their bids. Uh, they were trying to combine many simple phrases like if you don't and give me a discount and I won't buy it. These are, you can see, um, you know, three um, different sentences that people have combined together. Um, students collaborated well. And most importantly, no language expert intervention was needed. Um, that's how you know the technology really works. Um, we got some comments from the language experts as well. Uh, what do they think about this? So, you know, they were really impressed, uh, you know, and they say without traveling abroad um, to the target language country, the learners were able to practice interactive listening with the two AI agents. Um, you know, over here they say understand by personal experience rather than watching videos or listening to lectures only. So, you know, great things um, we found out. All right, this is all great. One of the things that used to bother me when I was learning a foreign language was, you know, yes, I'm learning this, but it feels really awkward and to go out in the real world and try it with real people. You know, what if I make a mistake? What if I make a fool of myself? I don't feel very, very comfortable. Um, so I asked students, how do they feel talking with the AI agents? And they said they're more comfortable talking to the AI agents than with actual humans. Um, they feel less anxious when they're talking with the AI agents than with humans. And um, the engagement is about the same. So without compromising on engagement, if you can create an environment that's more comfortable and less anxiety ridden, you know, we think we can improve the willing willingness to communicate um, with AI rather than humans. So willingness to communicate, by the way, is another term that's used um, this problem that I told you, I feel really awkward to use my foreign language with real people is a real problem. Anyone who learns a foreign language will mostly face it at some point in their life. Um, and how to improve willingness to communicate is its own line of research. And I think that if you use AI agents, um, that might go a long way. So that's, that's something for the future to, um, for maybe the next PhD student to explore. Um, so summary of my contribution is you know, the typical way of learning, you sit in a white wall classroom, you look at your page, uh, instead of each other, you're reading out from your book, um, 
but instead the Rensselaer way of learning, you're engaged in the new environment with AI agents, you're collaborating with each other um, and you're really having conversations. So that's, that's my, the summary of my contributions. Um, some offshoots of my project, the, the video that you saw of AI agents haggling with each other, well, that's such a complex research problem that it was actually presented to the uh, international uh, community of um, AI researchers as a competition. And in fact, that competition is going to happen now in August where um, you know, developers will submit an AI agent uh, which will compete with another AI agent from another team and with a human being. Um, so it's, it's that deep um, of a research problem that we're able to get. Um, by the way, um, this conference here that um, which runs this competition or which has agreed to run our competition is the International Joint Conference of AI. It's uh, probably one of the top 10 AI conferences in the world. Um, so that's an offshoot of the project. Um, these are my peer reviewed contributions. Um, these are some mentions in the media. Um, and, and I would like to thank my collaborators. You know, all of this great work cannot be done without collaboration. Um, on, on the top, the five people are my committee members. And um, on, on the bottom are all of the other undergraduate students, um, research staff, and, and other professors that I have worked with um, throughout my five years at RPI. Um, I would like to acknowledge, acknowledge the uh, you know, contribution from the Cognitive Immersive Systems Lab. They have funded my research. IBM Research has funded uh, me. Uh, MPAC has funded me. So. Um, I would like to thank them all too. And with that, I will stop right here. Um, by the way, this is a, a photo of my campus. Uh, well, photo of my campus when things used to be normal and you could actually go to the campus. So you can see some <laughs> human beings over here. Um, but on the left, this is the building that my lab is in. And this is the building where uh, you, know, the, you saw the big massive uh, screen that's in this building. Um, so with that, I will stop talking and um, see if anyone has any questions. Um, yes. Thank you, Dr. Rahul, for those wonderful insights. And I am very sure that we all will be taking back something valuable from this talk today. And now, moving to our Q&A session, we have a few questions from our students that they would like you to address. Uh, so the first one is, as for us engineering students, how do you think can we start with this in terms of some basic projects that you would recommend for better understanding? Um, start with this um, as in in terms of start with research or um, you know, start with what? So I'm assuming it start with research. Um, I can reflect back on my own experience. Um, you know, computer science, one of the things is um, get your background, uh, get your basics uh, well. If you're coding, whichever language you choose, then you should be able to code well. Uh, one of the good ways to do it is join ACM, join TechNAC, uh, do all of these projects that come through um, the, um, the, the university or, or the college that you're in. You know, we used to have so many projects that used to come in um, through NGOs and so on, and we used to um, develop so many things for them. So that gives you a good background um, to be a good researcher first, be a good computer um, science student, and then um, start to get into research as much as you can. Um, you know, if you can run a study, um, submit a paper, um, and most likely your first paper will get rejected. And that's a great thing. Learn from that rejection. Learn how to write better. Um, that's another way of doing it. Um, one of the big part of doing research is also writing about it. Um, so you saw some peer reviewed contribution. The typical process when you write a paper is to submit it and then four or five other experts from the field will come and criticize it, criticize your methods, criticize your writing and so on. Um, and then you have to fix that. Um, or sometimes they will just reject it if it's too many criticisms. Um, 
so there is a course actually on Coursera called um, I forget, but it's from Stanford. But it's about writing in research or something like that. Um, you know, go through that course. It will teach you how to write. Writing is definitely writing and reading is definitely a big part of research. Um, so along with writing, also read. Um, find your interest. I won't say find your passion because that's such a big word. Um, uh, but interest, you know, start over there. You are interested in language learning. All right, let's go read something about it. Maybe you start with the Wikipedia. But you know what? At the bottom of the Wikipedia page, they have references. So go click that actual paper. Try to read that paper. Um, and that's that's some, you know, some basic ideas to start with. Um, if none of this makes sense or um, if you are even slightly interested, go talk to your professor. Um, you know, Amaya sir would be a great person who can tell you where to start in DBIT. Maybe he can give you some projects even. Um, go talk to your professors. Go see what's around. Um, you know, you have to make the best of where you are at right now. So you are in DBIT. Go see what's in DBIT. Go see what resources are available. I'm sure um, there are a lot of resources available and make use of them. Um, did I answer that question sufficiently? Please let me know uh, whoever asked that question. Yeah. Uh, so we have another question. Um, what do you suggest are the coming up leading edge technologies that students could try and learn or maybe something related to AI tools or software that they could try? Um, yeah, so AI um, is definitely a technology that's coming up. Um, I was saying, um, well, one thing, there are many, many great technologies that are coming up. AI is just one of them. The other thing that's really booming right now is quantum computing. Everyone is moving towards that. Um, cloud computing and blockchain, you hear all of that uh, also a lot these days. So these are all great, um, uh, great things that are happening in computer science right now. Uh, as far as to, you know, what tools? Well, um, it, I would say that tools matter less. Um, than anything else. See, here's the thing. If you know how to program in Python and someone says, hey, can you write something in JavaScript? You know, yes, it might take you one or two days to get adjusted to that new language, but um, that's the easy part. <laughs> um, you will get adjusted very quickly. Um, so uh, tools is really up to you. Just pick one for now. Um, if you are working on a project already, Pick the tool that everyone else is using um, so that if you have a problem, your friends can help you. Or if you're just contributing code to the repository, um, you know, if your friend is contributing in, in Python and you want to write JavaScript and then someone has to integrate those two different languages together, that's, and that adds more complexity. Um, just pick a tool and um, start with it. Um, is that what you meant by tool, or um, did you have a different definition of tool in mind? I and think I th that was it. And okay. any languages like that you suggest, like that are coming up, or like we should emphasize more on it. Well, again, um, like I said, languages are something that matter less. If you can program in C plus plus you are very well, just as likely to program well in um, in Java as well. And uh, from a jobs perspective, if you're asking, uh, at least in the United States, when they do an interview, they give you the option, you know, pick whichever language you want to pick and show us that you can program. Because knowing how to program is the hard part. Then the language, yeah, today it's JavaScript. 10 years on, JavaScript is going to probably be obsolete, who knows? You know, if you look at the history of uh, computer languages, there used to be Cobalt and you know, mainframe languages, uh, probably before even I was born. And now you almost don't hear of them, right? So, you know, what makes you think that what the, the language that's um, trendy today is going to still live 20 years from now? I don't know, but what does not go away is your skill to program. Um, so if you learn to program in JavaScript, yeah, 20 years on, it's going to change and you will adapt to it very quickly. You know, even two months on, your company might say, um, yeah, you know JavaScript, but it would be great if you learn Python. Yeah, that's going to take you two days. Um, 
hard part is learning how to program and, and get that right. Um, to do that, there's a bunch of websites that can help you. Leadcode.com um, gives you some interesting programming problems that you can practice on your own. I think Hacker Rank is another one. Um, you can do this on your own. Just go to that website. Um, every time you hit refresh, they give you a new problem to solve. Right, that code, um, you can pick any language you want. And um, that's how you practice and learn. So, yeah. Um, yeah, and we wanted to know whether like AI agents will actually replace all the workforce in the near future. What are your thoughts on it? Um, you no, know, <laughs> not certainly not all the workforce. Um, I was just, you know, in some of my slides, I was showing you how difficult it is to talk to AI agents. The amount of complexity we have just in our communication, AI agents cannot even do that today, not even half of that maybe. Um, so they're not going to replace every job on the earth, uh, but they are going to replace a lot of the jobs. That's my, um, that's my guess of it. You know, think, Anytime you want to predict the future, look at the history, right? So what happened in the industrial revolution? Um, did machines take all of our jobs? No, but they took a lot of jobs. A lot of the things were automated back then, you know, 100 years ago. Um, and a lot of things will be automated now because of AI agents, but not everything will be. Um, and the good part, and that's a good thing because now you don't have to wash your own clothes with your own hand. You can use a washing machine, right? So same way, maybe 10 years from now, you don't have to um, do all of those things. I don't even know what those things might be, but you don't have to do all of those uh, things and you get to focus on doing something creative that AI agents or automation cannot do. So um, that's my opinion on it, but you know, depending on who you ask, um, some people say everything will be replaced by AI agents and some people say nothing will be replaced by AI agents. I think um, it's somewhere in the middle where a lot of things will be replaced and the economy and the job market will change. Um, so keep an eye out for that. Um, what's most likely to happen, like even in my uh, even in my dissertation, I saw that it wasn't that AI agents couldn't, can replace teachers, no way. Uh, what they do is augment what teachers already teach. So supplement what teachers already do. So teachers can do X and Y things. AI agents can do A and B things. But if you put them together, now you do A, B, and X, Y, and that's a great thing. Um, so it's the marriage of humans and, you know, not marriage, but, you know, the, the collaboration of AI agents and humans. Um, and that's where the future is, I think. Okay, thank, thank you so much. Um, I would finally like to invite our faculty member, Ms. Dipali Kayante, to propose the vote of thanks. Uh, Nicole, one, I have one question. Hello. Yeah. 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 Uh, Rahul, I have a question that now you are a DBA at Alumnus and uh, you have worked with ACM and all things are there. Now, uh, what do you suggest that uh, what we have in this time what we are supposed to do what we can do for as a teacher or as a student what we are supposed to do in this time yeah um, that is um, that is a very interesting question i think the whole world is uh, <laughs> grappling with this exact same question um, here we call it the new normal right what are you supposed to do in this new normal um, i think for as far as we can see um, education is going to be online and um, you doing this webinars are great. Um, I don't know how the examination is going to change, but at least the instruction can be done online. Um, one thing that may be worth looking into is open book examinations. Now you cannot control what humans do in their homes, right? Um, so just give them problems that they cannot find in the textbook. <laughs> um, you know, the textbook can be next to them, but they have to um, get creative and, and um, solve a problem based on what is in the textbook. Um, certainly gives um, all educators an opportunity to come together because um, this is a time when everyone is free. Um, uh, if college was normally working, I would not be able to stay up until 2 a.m. to give this talk. But now the, in this new normal, everyone is home and everyone is comfortable and 
it allows more collaboration. So um, get on that opportunity to collaborate, um, get as many people as possible to give talks and um, um, and I think you're already doing it. So that's a great thing. Um, so those are some things that we can do. Thank you, Rahul. Thank you. Nicole, please continue. Yeah, so uh, thank you, Rahul, for addressing all our questions. I think uh, it was a wonderful um, event uh, session and we will surely be taking back something valuable from this. And uh, now I would like to invite our faculty member, Ms. Dipali Kayande, to propose the vote of thanks. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, well, it's my pleasure to present the vote of thanks to all who have helped us in making this webinar such a resounding success. First of all, I would like to propose hearty vote of thanks to Dr. Amya Kumar Tripathi for gracing today's uh, webinar. Thank you, sir, for your very interesting and thought-provoking address. I would like to thank our distinguished speaker, Dr. Rahul Divekar, for making excellent presentation. Rahul, your insights on foreign language acquisition were interesting and thought-provoking. Also, the work you have done on your research topic is vast, and I hope many of the students will be inspired from your dedication. I would like to express our profound gratitude to our principal, Dr. Prasanna Nambia, for her constant support. I would also like to thank our beloved HOD, Ms. Sana Sheikh, for her moral support and guidance. I'm happy to express a vote of thanks to our staff members who have made this webinar a grand success. I would like to thank all the student volunteers who has worked really very hard in making this event a huge success. Thank you so much, all of you. Finally, the wonderful participants who have turned up in such great numbers, not only from our department, but also from other departments from other colleges. Thank you so much all for your cooperation. Once again, I thank you all for your cordial cooperation. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, really glad to be here. Um, Thank right. you, Rahul, for accepting our invitation. Yes, of course. All right. Hi. Uh, and right now, we'll be uh, forwarding our feedback on your WhatsApp groups. Please fill that. And thank you so much for attending the session. Thank you all.